Welcome to Murfreesboro Storytellers, our program this month originating in the council chambers for the Murfreesboro City Hall. And we're here today to talk about the future, Murfreesboro 2035. Our guests are Rob Lyons, city manager for the city of Murfreesboro, and Brett Keast, who is the president and owner of Kendi Keast Collaborative. Welcome. Good Thank to have you. you gentlemen with us. Thank you. The future is 2035. Yeah. Rob, what is this all about? Sure. Uh, uh, John, our, our future begins now. Uh, Murfreesboro is embarking upon a, a process to create a comprehensive plan or roadmap for our community for the next 20 years. Uh, this is something we're very excited about. Uh, clearly, we're a rapidly growing community, and we want to engage our community and, and create our future. What is the projection for the population 2035? Well, we'll dig uh, into that in greater detail during the course of the sure. uh, project, but it's, by some estimates, we could be as large as 200,000 people. And presently, we're where, 120? Yes, sir. 120,000. Brett, we're welcome to Murfreesboro. You Thank and you. your farm. Tell us about your company and, and okay. your work. Um, well, first, we're very pleased to be here. We uh, have enjoyed ourselves thus far. Look forward to working with the city in the next couple of years. Um, we are a community planning firm. We specialize in doing comprehensive plans as well as uh, plan implementation, being zoning, land development regulations, etc. cetera. Um, we have been in business for 35 years and we work nationally. So we tend to focus on communities this size and, and smaller primarily. Um, we've done over 100 comprehensive plans across the country and over 100 uh, plan implementation projects across the country as well. Name some of the other communities similar to Murfreesboro where you've worked. Oh gosh, um, we've worked in places like Amarillo, Texas, okay. and uh, uh, Paducah, Kentucky, nearby, Florence, right. South Carolina, Florence County. Um, a few of the. And you're headquartered in Texas. We are. We are in Sugarland, Texas. We have another office in um, Sacramento area, and an office in Wisconsin as well. All right. What will be the length of your work on this project for Murfreesboro? Um, we're generally looking at about a two-year time frame. Okay. So we are just getting underway, and uh, we'll be basically working in an iterative process, developing individual elements or chapters of the plan as, as we go. So every couple months there will be a new chapter coming forward. Rob, I presume this uh, idea for the, working on the future came through the city council and the mayor's office as well as the city manager? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sure did. You know, we, uh, John, we've done a lot of long-range planning in our community. Uh, we've done land use plans for uh, Salem Highway, uh, for the Blackman area, for Manny Avenue. Uh, we've got long-range plans for our transportation elements, uh, for our wastewater uh, treatment facilities. Uh, but what we haven't done since 1984 is do it all at once and bundle it all together and really, as the name implies, do it comprehensively. So uh, as we began to talk uh, with the mayor and council uh, during budget this year, uh, we really felt it was time uh, for us to do that and we're excited to uh, get with uh, the program and get moving on it. That's tremendous so to be able to work on the growth of our community and have it in a planned way so the community develops where I, everybody is pleased to be in and bring more people to this good community. Sure, yeah, our community is experiencing changes. Uh, any rapidly growing community is going to experience sure. changes and you know, we all want to retain that character of Murfreesboro, the, what makes this place special to us, why we love uh, calling it home. Uh, but we also want to be prepared for the future, not only just from a land use standpoint, but, but also financially, so that if we're going to grow, where do we need to direct the growth uh, so that from a, a fiscal standpoint, uh, we can be uh, sustainable and, and maintain our affordability. How did you happen to select Brett and his company? Sure. Well, we felt it was going to be important to do a competitive uh, selection process. Uh, so we uh, sent out uh, a notice to uh, come one, come all, that if they were interested in uh, partnering with Murfreesboro to help us with a comprehensive plan to, to submit a proposal. Uh, we got, I believe, 14 uh, responses. Mm -hmm. And then we used a, a cross-section of city departments as well as um, the chairs of all our big boards and commissions, our Water and Sewer Commission, our School Board, uh, the Planning Commission, uh, to help us select a consultant. So uh, we shortlisted it and then conducted interviews that were open to the public. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, our uh, selection committee uh, unanimously selected Kendi Keast, and we're excited that they're here. Well, you had a first meeting, for, uh, I guess what we would call a community-wide meeting, had uh, real good attendance, I believe. And tell us how that worked out. Sure, we had uh, 200 people come uh, to our community kickoff uh, session, which we're really pleased about. You know, we weren't exactly sure what kind of turnout uh, we were going to get, but I think that demonstrates to us the interest in our community to, to plan for our future. And Brett, as I recall, you had the group divided into three sections. 
to talk about the different aspects of the plan, explain how that, how that, that was set up. Yeah, generally at the outset of the process, this is the first of many uh, future public meetings coming forward. Um, so we, generally last night, really wanted to just understand the community better, start hearing from the residents, uh, giving them an opportunity to get involved and to uh, spread the word. Um, so we had kind of a general session where we described what a comprehensive plan is and why it's important. And then from there, we spent most of the evening listening and breaking down into smaller groups, topical areas focused on things like community character, uh, community livability, and growth. Um, so we had facilitators at each of those sessions, and generally we were asking for issues pertaining to those topics and then any improvement needs and priorities so we can start to hear from the community what they're most concerned about. And Rob, I believe as far as your organization, you do have a Murfreesboro 2035 <coughs> group that, that is shepherding this whole process. Yeah, and, and one of the things that really made Kendi Key stand out in the interview process was you know, their focus on community engagement. Uh, when we began talking to the city council about developing a comprehensive plan, the message was loud and clear from our council. We want to make sure this is a community-based plan, and that's where uh, Kendi Key really became an excellent fit for us. Uh, so as we begin looking at the development of the comprehensive plan, uh, Kendig Keast has given us a lot of different ways to engage the community. Uh, they're going to have meetings like the community kickoff where you know, the entire community is invited to come and participate. Uh, they're also going to have some small uh, focus groups uh, where they're going to engage different segments of the community and really dig down into some of the details about you know, that segment of our, our community, whether it be uh, you know, civic and, and nonprofits, or education, or uh, real estate and development. Uh, but then they've also got a, a steering group called our uh, 2035 Task Force, and this is a, a broad representation of Murfreesboro. We've got about 20 folks on that committee that become a, a sounding board for uh, the consultant in the city uh, to begin developing that draft and making some recommendations. Uh, ultimately, uh, the comprehensive plan will uh, be placed before the planning commission for their. Uh, review and approval and then after the Planning Commission would uh, recommend the plan it would go to the Mayor and City Council for their approval. So this group of 20 becomes a, a, a good place for uh, us to bounce ideas off to make sure that it's heading in a, in a good direction and because they represent you know various interests in our, our city we feel like they'll be a, a good sounding board for us. So we had a good start with the, with the community meeting. Now, what is the next part of the uh, overall plan, Brett? Uh, we had a terrific start. We were very pleased with the outcome and the quality of the comments. We had a lot of very well-educated uh, folks that really knew the community and brought forward some, some terrific issues for us. Um, from this point forward, we will start doing some of our background analysis. As Rob mentioned, there's been a lot of planning that's been done already. Um, starting to pull all those together, looking at population projections, really getting our arms around where do we see this community going. Mm -hmm. um, and then starting to prepare some of the initial elements. Um, so we will be back uh, later, this, later this year uh, starting to present a couple of those elements and working our way towards the next uh, big community workshop in the spring. At that workshop, we really intend to make it hands-on and, and, and fun and inviting and engaging. Uh, we call it kind of a maps and markers type of exercise where we really get out land use plans and transportation plans and really start looking physically at the layout of the community and where we should go, where it makes sense to grow, where we have utilities and infrastructures and not encroaching on resources. Um, you know, some of the uh, projects that were brought out last night with ideas for transportation alignments and things of that nature to give them an opportunity to really start helping us lay this out. So as I mentioned earlier, it is an iterative process. So we develop an individual element, we come and we present it, we discuss it, we identify changes, what we missed, what we need to think about, and we just kind of work our way iteratively through the process, uh, particularly with staff as well as, as the task force. You mentioned transportation. Was edu is education one of the aspects of this study, in the need for schools and locations of schools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you'll see that uh, in, in across the board, really, but okay. uh, primarily we tend to focus on that in economic development really thinking about how do we educate the workforce and, and uh, that's a big part of attracting business to have an educated workforce and of course to, mm -hmm. to grow our children and uh, having the uh, university here as well is, mm -hmm. is a significant contributor to this community. And will MTSU be a part of this process as well as everyone else? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, MTSU is a huge uh, influence not only in Murfreesboro but all of Middle Tennessee. Uh, their footprint and their impact uh, on our region is uh, substantial and, and they'll clearly be a partner through this. 
Do I understand also from your community meeting that individuals may go online and participate in, in the whole project? How does that work? Absolutely. Um, we really, as Rob said, we really want to create every possible opportunity for sure. people to participate. The more folks we have involved in this process, the stronger this plan is going to be and be representative of the community in this future. Uh, we do have a project website um, that will allow folks at their pleasure, their time, to uh, go in and participate. We'll be posting questions. They can respond to those questions. They can give us ideas. People can vote on those ideas. And as we proceed through the process, it can also be used to help prioritize some of the primary projects. And we think that'll be a great way really to think out of the box and get the entire community involved. We understand that uh, everyone's busy. Uh, life can get uh, busy and complicated and our schedule's full, but by you know, providing that online opportunity to, to you know, have a conversation with the city and the consultant, we really think that becomes a convenient way for them to participate if they're not able to make it out to the meetings. Uh, the useful thing about that as well is, is information on the plan is developed. Uh, we can put that online so uh, folks can, can read that. You know, I can remember back in the day, uh, if you wanted to get information about some of our, our projects and study, you had to come down here or we had to send a fax sure. or, or make copies in the mail. But now we're going to be, we really want to be transparent and, and open about this process and this will give us a great tool for doing that. And what we've found is that a lot of people will, will tune into that, they will sign in and they will just remain in the background but they'll be watching the process. Mm -hmm. They'll be paying attention to what's going on and then you'll have a lot of folks that are very active in terms of participating and putting their comments and opinions and thoughts forward. So. Um, we don't want to put too much emphasis on that because it's just it's one way uh, to help engage the community together with going out and talking to community groups and, and the task force and other large uh, come one, come all community uh, get-togethers like we had. And earlier. you're also developing a newsletter, is that right? It'll periodically be available? Yeah, I believe we will be <laughs> developing, I think it's like 10 newsletters. Um, so we really want to help get some, some print out there that describes um, what's been done, where we are in the process, where they can uh, access uh, documents, where they can get involved, uh, as well as just keeping everybody up to date on um, the development of the plan. What is your impression of the community of Murfreesboro? Well, I think it's a prideful community. It's, it's a place that everybody is obviously uh, very, very proud of. Okay. Um, as we spoke at the community forum, there's uh, folks that have chosen to live here and raise family here and invest in this community and that's very important to us. So that's why we want to really engage them. This is their community and it's a place that they want to raise their kids and have their kids come back to. Um, so it's got a lot of terrific history as Rob pointed out in the, in the uh, community forum. Um, you know, it's, it's a very livable community and I think one of the things we really want to focus on is the character of this community. What sets Murfreesboro apart from other communities in the state and across the nation and how can we build on that in the future to make it continue to be a special place. We certainly have come a long way from being, if you will, a bedroom community for Nashville as we've been called in years gone by and becoming an independent city within itself. Sure, and I think it, it's helpful for all of us to, to step back as we uh, begin this process to think about the region of Middle Tennessee. And, and while Murfreesboro is this independent city and, and has got all this great character, uh, we're part of a larger region. Middle Tennessee is an area that is absolutely exploding. You can see the lists of uh, most livable, job growth, affordability, uh, quality of life. Middle Tennessee consistently shows up on those and what that means is that becomes an attractive place for people to come. So all of Middle Tennessee is experiencing uh, this rapid growth and, and I know during the community meeting we'll hear a lot of conversation about growth and how much should we grow and how quickly should we grow. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we're going to grow. This is a very desirable place and it, the comprehensive plan becomes a great tool uh, for us to make sure that we can maintain that quality of life and to maintain that sense of place uh, that people are, are proud of and that uh, we can hold on to that without it uh, getting uh, ruined. I know in one of, the, one of the groups that I was in last night, one person said they didn't want to see us grow anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't think we could ever stop it and the idea is to have plan growth and mm -hmm. make it like we, we want it to be sure. and make it a good community. Mm -hmm. Give us some of that history you traced at the community meeting as far as the, the city of Murphy's there. Sure. You know, it, it, it's interesting when you look about the different, you know, phases and evolution of, of our community. Um, you know, many of our residents may not realize that Murfreesboro was the state capital. True. Um, the state capital had been in Nashville uh, because Murfreesboro is the geographic center of the state. Uh, the General Assembly felt uh, it needed to be in the geographic center of the state, so they moved the state capital uh, to, to Murfreesboro. 
Uh, now, some of the records remain back in Nashville, and uh, after a few years, uh, the General Assembly asked the County Commission uh, to relocate the rest of the records from Nashville to Murfreesboro, but they wanted the County Commission to pay for it. I believe it was something less than $100. Uh, the County Commission declined the General Assembly's <laughs> offer. <laughs> so over uh, less than $100, uh, our history was uh, forever changed. Um, and they moved the capital back to, to Nashville. Uh, I like to have a little bit of fun with telling Murfreesboro's history, uh, but I've been told that uh, because of the railroad, uh, Murfreesboro became the mule capital of the South. Um, and as I uh, joked last night, uh, Columbia seemed to uh, wrestle that away from us. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you can't be the state capital and you can't be the mule capital of the South, you have to be something right. So uh, Murfreesboro had the world's largest cedar bucket. Uh, certainly true, uh, yeah. something to be uh, proud mm -hmm. of, not. Uh, not some small feat, but uh, unfortunately the Cedar Bucket burned down, John. Uh, so if you can't be the state capital and you can't be the mule capital of the South and you can't have the world's largest Cedar Bucket, uh, you need to have something. And uh, according to Amazon, uh, Murfreesboro is one of the top 10 most romantic communities in the country. Uh, this is uh, a true statement. How did statement. Amazon come up with that? They, they uh, measure the sales of uh, romantic uh, comedy movies, right. uh, romance novels, and uh, believe it or not, the uh, sale of Barry White CDs. So <laughs> given all those metrics, uh, Murfreesboro is one of the most romantic cities in the country. And, and kind of the challenge that, uh, in a fun way, I tried to, to send to the folks who attended the uh, community meeting <clears throat> was, you know, we really do want to aim big, and we want to shoot big about where we want to be in 20 years. You know, what do we want to be known for? Sure. Uh, there's a ton of opportunity, and the ingredients are all there, you know, especially with the university. Uh, so, you know, what is it that we can uh, stake our claim and really ensure that we remain economically strong and financially viable? Uh, you know, we've heard those comments already that, you know, in order, you know, we're growing right now and that gives us resources to build new roads and build new schools. Uh, but you need to be careful that, you know, your, your future is sustainable. And so what is it that we need to do to aim big so that we can, you know, stake that claim and be known for, for something that's going to continue to uh, keep this community very vibrant, including our downtown? We've, we've been challenged to, uh, to, to stretch and to challenge the community. Mm -hmm. um, so, in fact, that's an environment we like working in because mm -hmm. we like to be innovative and think outside the box, and we feel that we've got a, a, a good match there with the community because that's what, what they're looking for as well. Uh, so we look forward to uh, helping the community think big and mm -hmm. think about some new concepts and new ideas and see where they go. You had three divisions at the community meeting, community character, community livability, and quality of life and growth capacity. Elaborate somewhat on, on how about community character? Well, um, I, I facilitated the community growth okay. uh, chapter, so what we're going to do with the input that we received is first we're going to type it all up and get it back out to the community so everybody can see what, what they heard last night. Um, with respect to community character to us, um, there's the things that most people identify as being character, as being uh, both history and culture mm -hmm. creates character, but also the physical environment, you know, urban design and uh, the design of roadways and things of that nature. But we look at it in terms of land use as well. If you think about different neighborhoods, they're all single family residential, but there's a major difference between different neighborhoods. And people choose neighborhoods for those, those character features or those characteristics of them. And so when we talk about land use, we really want to put things into um, you know, descriptions of what creates that character. So we'd think a little bit differently about that. So we heard a lot of comments last night about just community appearance and community betterment um, in, the, in the character session. And we'll be, uh, as I said, getting uh, more of that information out as we proceed in this process. I heard some discussion about walkable communities where you can walk to uh, restaurants, to uh, grocery stores, more development along that line. How does that, how does that work? Indeed. Um, we heard a lot about that, I think, across the board in all, mm -hmm. the, all the different sessions. And he knows communities develop, they tend to um, develop with different uses in different areas. And so therefore, they're not necessarily walkable. You have commercial in one area and residential right. in another, and most people get in the car to drive there. And so part of what we were doing last night was challenging the community to think differently, that we mm -hmm. have to think about different zoning regulations that provide for more blending of uses or mixed uses so that you can create truly vibrant, walkable places. Okay. But to do that, that's going to take some thinking outside the box for this community. It's mm -hmm. going to be having different regulations in place and having a different plan that kind of lays out how, that, how that's going to work. 
You mentioned about Sugar Land, Texas, where you were located and how it was uh, developed and laid out with, with similar plans and has, has achieved that, right? Indeed. The, the advantage that Sugar Land had was that it was primarily a master plan community yeah, from the very of 70,000 population. Mm -hmm. So you had one master developer that really had control. Um, here, it's a much different environment where we don't, we don't have that other than you know, certain areas of town. So we have a lot of different property owners and different interests. And, and so it's trying to stitch that all together into a fabric that makes sense and works well for this community and contributes to uh, a quality character and quality of life. And I think that's a, you know, an interesting uh, comment because you know, unlike a community that can be master planned uh, from the very beginning, Murfreesboro is 200 years old right. and we've got our, our older neighborhoods in our downtown. Uh, and it's going to be important that during the comprehensive plan process that we focus on that area. You know, much of the conversation talked about growth and as the city uh, limits might move out, and that clearly is important in coming up with good design and ordinances and regulations to create the kind of neighborhoods and growth that we want to see is, is important. Uh, but we do not want to lose sight of the fact of the importance of our downtown uh, and our historic preservation and, and our neighborhoods downtown and, and the people who have been here for a long time for generations. Uh, so, you know, the combination of you know old and new is going to be uh, something that'll be a challenge for for all of us and one we're, we're ready to embrace one of the early statistics that we looked at if if indeed this community is going to grow to approaching 200,000 people uh, in another 20 years 60 percent of our housing stock will be over 30 years old so many of these neighborhoods are are very old so the question in the plan is going to be how do we continue to sustain the vibrancy of these neighborhoods mm -hmm. as we get older and older housing stock and sure. older infrastructure. Uh, so we really need to think about strategies for revitalizing and redeveloping and infill development. I think oftentimes too much focus is on developing on the edge. Mm -hmm. That's the easy development, developing on green fields. The more difficult development is, is on some of the infill parcels and redevelopment and continuing to kind of put some of that development um, back into the city. So when we start to quantify the number of, of folks, the number of acres of development, we first need to think about how much of that can be, can occur within the current city limits where we already have infrastructure and schools and sidewalks and parks and trails, as opposed to developing all on the edge. Um, so that's going to be a, a significant challenge for us as we work into this imagine. process. And I can think about communities that I've visited that have done just that. Uh, that really reinvested in, in their older neighborhoods because those do become the walkable places, yeah. uh, the places that you know you, you get uh, young professionals moving into or the residents who have been there for generations really enjoying a, a better quality of life, that they have all those things that are, are walkable. I can think about a neighborhood I lived in, Washington, D.C., uh, that I could walk uh, one block and my vet was there, an Italian restaurant was there, an Irish pub, a bookstore, movie theater. You had all those things that were very walkable, and that was an awesome environment to, to be in. Imagine, so yeah. uh, we, we can see opportunities as we visited other communities to create that same sense of place and build upon uh, the great neighborhoods we already have. What about the balance or the relationship with apartments versus single family uh, dwellings? How does that work out? Well, we heard a lot about that last night. Yes. Um, and as my point last night was that in fact, I was just reading in the USA Today yesterday an mm -hmm. article about um, housing starts across mm -hmm. the nation. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing since the mortgage crisis is that there's a lot more folks that are renting mm -hmm. and not investing in home ownership. And so we're seeing a shift nationally. And this is not unique to this community, but it's every community that we're working in right now across the country. Um, so we are seeing a lot more uh, rental. And that's going to, quite frankly, going to be something that every community is going to be grappling with as to how do we... Uh, work them into the community. Some of the comments we heard last night was just when you have large apartment complexes, you have significant density of population, you have lots of traffic. Sometimes that outstrips the capacity of the mm -hmm. roads. Uh, so it's something that we really have to look at and think strategically about uh, how do we accommodate um, apartment living environments? How do we allow them to sustain their quality over time? And where is an appropriate location for them relative to you know, other, other types of uses. Yeah, and that, that multifamily development really, there's more than one flavor of that. You know, we've got, you know, townhouses that might be geared more toward seniors. We've got multifamily that's targeted toward young professionals with the university here. We've got student housing. Uh, then you've got other uh, multifamily and apartment complexes. So there's more than one flavor of that and, and finding a good space and fit for that will, will be something that we want to focus on. And it's not uncommon, we've worked in a lot of university communities, it's not uncommon to have a higher percentage of rental for mm -hmm. obvious reasons. 
Um, so I don't think we need to overemphasize that, but we certainly need to keep our eye on it and, and try to help address some of the things that mm -hmm. folks are concerned about. And we have a rather large apartment development going on near the avenue right now in the yes. city of Murfreesboro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we sure do. And you know, we, we have seen a number of applications come to the Pontiac Commission City Council uh, for multifamily, and there's been a lot of conversation and input from the community. So uh, clearly that'll be one of the things for us to study on. Any other uh, comments about the community livability, the quality of life? The uh, parks and the cultural activities, we haven't, we haven't touched on that. Yeah, well, I think this community has done very well in its parks and recreational facilities and the trail system. Um, you know, I think what's going to be important as we, as we grow, when you think about the amount of growth that's contemplated, it's 10 square miles of residential development is what represents 80,000 people. So we need to think about what trail facilities and greenways and resource protection and new parks and start planning for those mm -hmm. now and even perhaps acquiring some land before development uh, raises sure. development costs. Um, so continuing to build on the systems that the, the community has. Obviously culture is going to be you mm -hmm. know, very, very important to provide cultural opportunities. Um, so we'll be looking at that aspect in the plan as well. Any comment about community health? How, how does that all fit into this planning process? Well, you talked about walkability earlier, and that's well, certainly true. one of the focuses mm -hmm. of uh, nationally in terms of looking at community health is, you know, we're a community that tends to walk out a front door and get in the car and drive to the next place and, and walk inside, and we spend very little time uh, walking. So it's part of it is thinking about our environment and how we're developing, uh, but also it's creating opportunities such as the community's trail system and getting people healthy, it's sure. access to health care. Um, so there's just a whole variety of uh, kind of a, a gamut of uh, different considerations with respect to health. I think about health facilities and what the Commonwealth Fund of New York meant to us historically with our health uh, department as well as our hospital. Yeah, sure. As the uh, Christy Houston Foundation has uh, made an everlasting uh, impact on our community and continues to do so. Certainly has. Well, our future begins now, yeah. Murfreesboro 2035. Yeah. Gentlemen, any closing comments on what's about to happen next and what to uh, expect from the community, what the community expects from the plan? Sure. Uh, well, we want you to get involved. Uh, Murfreesboro2035.com uh, will be one central place for you to go for more information about meetings, uh, information presented by our, our consultants. So uh, we enjoy, invite you to participate and get plugged in. Fred, any finally, uh, final comments that you might have about the whole process? I think uh, the recent community forum energized all of us. Uh, we're very excited. Uh, we hope the community is excited as well and motivated. This needs to be a plan that, that motivates and, and um, it, it, this can't be something that falls all on the council or all on Rob or anybody else. It has to be a community supported plan. So I think it's so very important that we have participation and engaged uh, residents. Uh, so we look very much forward to uh, seeing what we learn about this community and laying out a plan and uh, seeing the community prosper in the future. Gentlemen, thank you for this conversation as we talk about Murfreesboro 2035. Rob Lyons, City Manager for the City of Murfreesboro, and Brett Keese, President and Owner of Kendi Keese Collaborative. And that's Murfreesboro Storytellers for this month.